Hey guys, it's Lexi, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about some tips for how you can specialize in dental school. So it's probably not surprising that one of the main factors that is considered when you apply to specialty programs is going to be your GPA and class rank. And I'm going to kind of go through with what would be considered a competitive GPA or class rank. And I just want to say that this is not meant to be some sort of fixed rule that you have to meet in order to specialize in a certain area of dentistry. This is more just to be a guideline or maybe to help inspire you to do your best in dental school. But remember that even if you don't fit within the criteria that I'm going to mention, it doesn't mean that you're not able to specialize. So while GPA can vary a lot from school to school, class rank is going to help to kind of level the playing field and to assess how well you're doing relative to the rest of your class. And not all dental schools are going to provide a class rank, and some schools are only going to rank a certain portion of the class, maybe the top 10 of the class, for example. And so if your school doesn't provide a class rank, then of course you would just ignore that criteria because it doesn't really apply to you. But speaking to those of you that go to dental schools that do give you a class rank, if you're considering applying to oral and maxillofacial surgery, that is going to be considered the most competitive specialty program. And so you're really going to want to be toward the top of your class. And again, these numbers are not really set in stone or, you know, these are just kind of what I've heard from my experience going through dental school, having friends that have applied to various specialty programs and listening to their stories and their input on what they think is basically considered a competitive class rank for their particular specialties. So for oral surgery, if you can be in the top 10% of your class, that's going to make you a highly competitive applicant. And if you can be at least in the top 25%, that's going to make you somewhat competitive. Whereas for orthodontics and endodontics, orthodontics is generally considered the second most competitive specialty program for dental students. Again, you're going to want to be in the top 10% if you can, but even if you can get into the top 30%, that's still going to make you somewhat competitive. And so I know of students that were only in the top 20 and they still were able to get into ortho, so you definitely don't have to be in that top 10%, but I would try to be within the top 30% if you can. Again, it doesn't mean that you won't get in if you're not in that top 30%. This is, again, just to motivate you and and it's a guideline. And in terms of endodontics, endodontics is known for being the specialty program that prefers work experience. And so if you're applying straight out of dental school, it is going to be more difficult for you to get in. And so having a higher class rank is going to help you. So for endodontics, assuming that you're applying straight out of dental school, I would recommend shooting for the top 10% if possible, but ideally at least in the top 30% to be somewhat competitive. And then for other specialty programs such as periodontics, prosthodontics, or pediatric dentistry, those are typically considered less competitive. With that said, maybe you want to get into a specific prosthodontic program, then you're going to want to have a higher class rank in order to target a specific program. However, if you're okay getting in anywhere, generally speaking, shooting for the top 25% is going to make you highly competitive, and you want to at least be in the top 50% to be somewhat competitive. And like I mentioned before, there are other factors that are considered, which I'm going to talk about. So just remember that even if you're only ranked 30 in your class, but let's say you crush the CBSE, then you can still have a good chance of matching into oral surgery, for example. So don't let this discourage you. Again, I'm just trying to give you guidelines and also to help motivate you to do your best. I do not mean to discourage anyone from pursuing a specialty that they're interested in. So please don't let this slide do that for you. So other factors to consider if you want to specialize are going to be the standardized exams. So if you're applying to oral and maxillofacial surgery residency, then you're going to have to take the CBSE exam, which is extremely important for your application to these programs. If you're planning on applying to an endodontic residency program straight out of dental school, then it's highly recommended that you take the ADAT. And the ADAT is required by some endodontic residency programs, not a lot of them, but about 10 of them, it is still accepted by other endodontic residencies and it can just help to make your application more competitive. And so if you want more information about the ADAT, I do have a video on that. So you can check out that video link in the description. And then if you want to apply to orthodontic residency programs, you're going to want to take the GRE. From my friends that got into ortho, they didn't say that it was super important. It seems to not be considered a very important factor, but you still do need to take it. So you should try to do well on 
on it, but it definitely doesn't seem as important as, for example, the CBSE is for oral surgery. So the next topic I'm going to talk about is research, and it is advised that you get involved in research if you're considering specializing. The earlier you can get involved, the better, and it's probably better if you can get involved in basic science or clinical research. You want to be able to either collect data or you could even contribute to a manuscript, maybe present a poster or attend research conferences or any combination of those things. And while publications and awards are definitely excellent to have on your CV, they're certainly not required. So don't stress if you don't have a publication. The next way to improve your competitiveness for a specialty program is going to be to try to get exposure to the field. And this just makes sense because if you plan on specializing in something, you definitely want to know what you're getting yourself into. So the more you can expose yourself, the better. You can do this either through shadowing or assisting. So if you're interested in oral surgery, you want to spend a lot of time in the OR. And if you want to do periodontics, then you can try to assist the perio residents at your school. If they don't have a perio program at your school, you could try to assist periodontists in the area in a private practice setting. Besides shadowing and assisting, you can also try to attend courses with the residents if that's possible at your school. So at my school, the residents would have a current literature review. And so if you can sit in on a couple of those, that would be useful. You can also try to go to national conferences. So for endodontics, there's the AAE conference that's once a year and other specialties have the same thing. So you can go to the national conference. You can also try to join a club at your school that's related to that specialty. And if a club doesn't exist, then you can create a club at your school. And then also I would recommend trying to get to know the residents and the faculty of whatever department you're interested in as soon as possible. And that's just going to be helpful if you need recommendation letters in the future, if the faculty know who you are and they know that you're interested in that specialty. And then the residents can just be really great mentors. And I found that for myself, getting to know the endodontic residents at my school has been very useful when I was applying. And then even now that I'm going to be starting the specialty program in the summer, it's really nice to have people that you can ask questions to. Moving on to leadership, you want to try to hold executive board positions in one or more dental school clubs, but make sure that you don't stretch yourself too thin and take on more than you can handle. If you can be a leader for one of the clubs that's related to your specialty, that's great, but don't stress about it. And then also remember that any leadership is better than no leadership. And so if you can't find a leadership opportunity at your dental school, then make sure you're looking outside of dental school as well, because you can also consider community leadership positions, whether that be through your church or other organizations. Moving on to service. So you're going to want to make sure that you track whatever service events you participate in as a dental student. And those could be Give Kids a Smile Day, as to food drives. Certain clubs are going to have service events that you can sign up to participate in. Then you can also find community service outside of dental school. That could be through your church or another organization. And then you can also include mission trips abroad that you might take as a dental student. And the last thing I wanted to mention are externships. These are mostly going to be applicable to those of you applying to OMFS residency programs where they can increase your competitiveness overall, especially for the programs that you extern at. And while these do exist for other specialty programs, they're not as common. If you want to do an externship, make sure you reach out to schools early on. In terms of trying to get that high GPA in class rank, for those of you that are still in your first or second year of dental school, I wanted to give you guys some advice on how you can try your best to get a higher class rank or a higher GPA. And I want to say that dental school is very stressful, especially the first and second year. And so it is very overwhelming if you consider the amount of information that you're expected to learn. And so I think it's really important to focus on time management and making sure that you schedule study sessions that you can stick to and that you can remain focused during whatever period of time you know yourself best. And so for some people, you're going to have to study more frequently and earlier before an exam. And then for other people, you can actually wait till closer to an exam and still do fine. So you kind of know yourself, but for most people, you're going to want to start studying earlier. And even if you're able to cram and procrastinate, it is still probably going to make your life a lot less stressful if you give yourself more time. You also want to figure out what works for you. So some people study at home. I have a friend in dental school that always studied at home, never went to the library, and that worked great for her. Whereas for other people, if they're at home, they're going to fall asleep or they're just going to keep eating or get distracted on their phone. And so it might be better to try to put your phone away and find a quiet area in the library where you can focus. And so just make sure you consider what environment that you know you work well in and then just be honest with yourself. Another
Another thing is if you're going to study in a group or if you're going to study alone, a lot of the times group studying can just become talking about other things that are not related to what you're studying. So I would just say be careful about studying in groups. I think if you are going to study in a group, make sure that it's a small group. I would say maybe no more than three people and that you can motivate each other. That's one benefit of studying in a group. You see your friends studying next to you, so you feel like you have to study. But just make sure that it's not something where you get distracted. So like for me and my friends, what we found effective was going into a quiet area of a library where we couldn't talk to each other. And then we would study sitting next to each other. So it was kind of motivating, but we were actually really studying alone. And it was more just seeing the other person studying would motivate you to keep studying, especially if it got late at night and you were tired and maybe at home you would be sleeping otherwise. And then in terms of studying in the morning or at night, um, I know a guy that would always study at five in the morning for our dental school classes. And I personally would never never want to do that. So I would prefer to stay up later at night and then sleep in a little bit more as opposed to studying in the morning. So it just depends on you. Then you can also consider studying on an iPad versus a laptop. So I personally use a Surface laptop that allows me to write on the screen. And so I was able to highlight my PowerPoint notes and I would make little annotations and then that would help me to memorize the information. And then sometimes I would even have a sheet of paper where I would just try to summarize key points that I needed to memorize and I would have maybe a few pieces of paper, sometimes even a single sheet, and I would use that to just really quickly go over the key points before an exam. And I'm such a hypocrite for saying this because I always procrastinated and I was always a ball of stress before every exam, but it's definitely better to avoid that if you can. So try to make yourself start early and don't wait until the exam is approaching to start learning everything. And then also make sure that you try to take good notes in class. And if you're someone who can't do that, which I personally couldn't really focus well when I was in class or I would miss something that the professor said that was important. And so what I did is I actually would try to re-watch the lectures and then just take really good notes as I listened to the lecture so that I had all of the information that I needed to know that I would then be able to go memorize when I was studying in the future. And then if your lectures are recorded, I would definitely recommend trying to get used to one and a half or two times speed. That's going to save you a lot of time because in dental school, you've got a lot of lectures to get through. And so if you can listen to them on two times speed and then pause, take notes and then keep listening, that can definitely help you to be more efficient. Just make sure that when you're listening to a recorded lecture that you stay focused and you try to make sure that you get really good notes from it because that really is the point of listening to the recording. And then also you want to try to stay healthy. So this is tough because I'm telling you to put all of this time and work into studying and then also to try to consider diet and exercise and sleep. And it really is difficult to balance. And I would just say that there's going to be times in dental school where you're very overwhelmed and you just really don't have the best balance and that's okay but just make sure that when everything sort of stabilizes and you're back in the groove of things maybe final exams are over to just not give up on trying to get back to that better diet and exercise and trying to get a regular sleep routine even if you can't you know keep that consistent throughout the first couple years of dental school during certain seasons that you're going through it's still worthwhile to try to get back on that healthy train whenever you can because your health does matter and so you want to just make sure that that's something that you're considering never let your stress from dental school compromise your mental health or your physical health so in terms of how I study or try to acquire information when I was in dental school basically what I did was I would try to go over the information multiple times and I think ideally you want to go over the information at least three times although sometimes I wasn't able to do that because there was just too many exams but ideally I would go through the information three times and I would aim on my first run through to go over the recording. So I would listen to the recording of a lecture and then I would write down basically verbatim what the professor said because a lot of it was important. But if you're good at consolidating the information, just try to write down what you think is important. And once you've got it all down and you say, okay, this is what I need to know, then the second run through, I try to actually understand because when I'm just writing down what I'm listening to in the recording, I'm not actually learning anything. But then in my second run through, I'm trying to understand it. And then by the time I go through my third run through, I'm really just trying to memorize what I already understand from the second run through. And then if you have a fourth run through, that's great because then you can just try to make sure, okay, I, I think I have this memorized. Let me go through it one more time to make sure. And it will help solidify what you've memorized. But again, a lot of the times you won't have time to go through it for a fourth time. So it just depends how early you start and how many exams you have coming up. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave 
leave them in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and also hit the notification bell so that you can stay up to date when I upload new videos.